My name is Jane Fisher and I am the faculty person responsible for the SLIS Career Development Team. Uh, we have several people on our team and I'm the one here representing us tonight. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We have the great pleasure of presenting three SLIS alumna talking about their work in different academic library settings. Our first speaker is going to be Christina Mune, and I will let her introduce herself. So take it away, Christina. Go for it. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Mune. I'm an academic liaison librarian, also known as a subject specialist liaison at San Jose State University for the Earth and Physical Sciences. Um, I'm also the online learning librarian here. And I graduated from SLIS in December 2011. And so I'm really pleased to be sharing um, my life as an academic librarian with you. So my name is Elizabeth Thomas. I work with Christina Mune. Um, I work at San Jose State University at, as the community outreach librarian. Um, and I also um, work at another library, um, Ohlone Community College Library, um, and that's in Fremont and Newark um, City. Um, and I'm a an, uh, reference librarian there. And I've been doing this for a little over five years. Hello, my name is Jeffra Bussman, and I graduated from SLIS in December of 2008. And I was fortunate to get hired at UC Irvine as a math, physics, astronomy librarian um, shortly thereafter. And uh, then I decided I desperately missed the Bay Area. And I moved back and um, moved to Cal State East Bay in, uh, I guess, July of 2012. So now here um, at CSU East Bay, I am uh, the STEM slash web services librarian. Thank you all. Christina, go for it. All right, well, thanks everyone to coming to From the Trenches, a day in the life of an academic librarian. So we actually have three academic librarians we're going to be talking to you today, which, you know, you've already met. And while um, I kind of get started, I was wondering if we all want to share in the chat box three words that describe maybe your ideal library job. So that could be something really simple like fun and flexible and easy, or I was thinking what I might put in there. Uh, which would be like online learning and community engagement and um, what was the other thing? Oh, faculty status. So those were three things that I really kind of were interested in when I was looking for my first library job. Um, and then maybe you could take those words and see if they fit with any of the types of libraries or librarianships that we talk about today. It could help maybe guide you. And if it doesn't fit with anything, then that might be another revelation for you. <laughs> but um, I think that might be fun. We can see what other people are interested in, in too, in, in regards to academic librarianship. Uh, and we've already introduced ourselves, but I want to let you know that I'm basically going to be going over a typical uh, liaison librarian uh, day in the life. Uh, Elizabeth's going to be talking to us about community outreach and adjunct status, which there's tons of adjunct librarians, and so that's something that you're going to come across quite a bit, so you want to know about that. And then Jeffrey is going to talk to us about the difference between being in a large research institution and like a four-year public college, so a UC maybe versus a CSU or a Harvard versus like a Florida State, it's this type of idea. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, so there's some action-packed slides in here, but don't worry if you kind of can't read all the stuff on them or can't take notes fast enough. Um, they're going to be downloadable for you later, and you can also download the whiteboard here so you can have the slides right now if you want them, and I believe that they're going to be posted online. So, um, you know, if you can't get to everything on the slide, don't worry. Um, so there's lots of academic library types, and the kind of type library you are like want to work in is really going to depend on what you're interested in with academic librarianship. So community colleges or junior colleges are typically kind of a two-year program for an associate degree, technical vocational certificates and transfer students. Um, they're trying to transfer students to the four-year public college or the, the research institution. And they're going to be doing a lot of outreach and instruction, reference, and kind of this jack of all trades because there's some staffing issues in community colleges that require you to kind of know about everything. So if you really like to have a lot of different responsibilities, that's a great place for you. And you might have faculty status in a community college, though to gain tenure.
there, you probably have to do some different things, which uh, we'll be talking about. A private liberal arts college is going to be a mostly undergraduate, small student body residential college. We're going to, again, do that jack of all trades type of idea because of the just limited number of people in the university library there. But also collection development would be more important because they'll have very specific collections based on the um, limited numbers of majors there. Uh, the four, year, four to six year public college like San Jose State or CSU East Bay or really Portland State or Texas State, um, they're going to be focusing on master's and bachelor's degrees. There's going to be more commuters and non-traditional students. So if you enjoy working with maybe underserved communities or, uh, you know, all types of students, that's a great place for you. There's an emphasis on instruction for both librarians and faculty because they're sometimes called teaching colleges because we're not really here for research. We're here to, you know, kind of teach and, and get you out and, and going in a career. So while you're going to be doing lots of reference and instruction, outreach is going to be a big deal. Moving to digital services is a big trend in this type of university. Um, there's definitely subject specialization. And at Cal State, you'll have faculty status, and many other state universities have that too. And if you're on the tenure track, research and publication is a must. So if you like that, that might be a good place for you. Um, the large research institution like Stanford, UCLA, or UC Irvine that we'll hear about from Jeffra is going to be focused on PhD programs and really on scholarly research. Um, so subject specialist librarians often have a second MA. Um, if you enjoy working on institutional repositories or big data, that would be a great place since it's research focused. And like I said, kind of in the last slide, there's lots of possibilities for the type of librarian you'd want to be. So reference and instruction librarians are all over every academic library. If you're interested in subject specializations, maybe community college isn't for you. Outreach librarians are always um, in need, and Elizabeth's going to tell us more about that. I see scholarly communication librarian postings a lot more lately, and I think that has to do with the institutional repositories that are being made and this need for like copyright and fair use information and the social sharing of research that's going on. People are really interested in um, getting positions that deal with that stuff. Uh, I meet also a lot of SLIS students that want to be catalogers. And um, I'm going to say catalog departments are generally shrinking or shrunk. So if you're really interested in cataloging, make sure you have a second kind of skill, like a second language or you know about art or something. You need to have like a, a way to be competitive. If you enjoy IT and servers and networks, systems librarianship is a great way to go. And digital initiatives and web librarians are like in huge demand right now. And so, you know, if you love new technology, you might want to think about that stuff. So this is a day in the life of me, an academic liaison librarian at San Jose State University. And this is, I'm going to point at it here, Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Library. It's actually an interesting library because it's a joint with San Jose Public, which makes it somewhat unusual. But it makes me appreciate being an academic librarian all the more. Um, we have 1.3 million books. <laughs> we have about 30,000 students at San Jose State and nine floors in our library, so it's, it's huge. Um, and some days during my like frantic, hectic schedules that we'll talk about as we go through, I remember that I asked for this and that I love it and that it's great and it's really making a difference, which is why I'm here. Um, but it's definitely an action-packed life. So this is our reference desk. It's pretty traditional, actually, even though it's joint with the public library. Um, we have librarians, so that's Sue. Uh, she's a, one of our librarians. And we have a lot of great staff and student assistants that work at the reference desk, which is really typical that there's a lot of paraprofessionals and student assistants that kind of make the library work. So that's actually a great way to get in, to get started. You know, you might want to think about that before you graduate. Um, but we have students come that ask anything from, I'm doing this huge research paper and I need lots of articles, to I don't know how to print my paper, please help me. And we answer all these things at the reference desk. Um, but there are kind of some innovative things that are going on in a lot of libraries and new trends about reference. Um, information commons is a new thing where people basically ask technology questions and writing questions and research questions at the same place. 
And at North Carolina State University, they created this Ask Us desk, which is one single service point in the entire library, and then librarians rove around and see if anyone needs help. So these are different models that you might run into as an academic librarian in the future. Um, and then also, as a subject liaison, I get to have students in my office for like an hour at a time, and we just talk about their subject and their topic, and that's some of the funnest stuff that, that I get to do. And of course, chat and email references occurring now. Many people, libraries have 24-7 chat widgets on their website. That doesn't mean you have to take a 3 a.m. reference shift. Usually there's a consortium, so someone in Australia is taking that 3 a.m. reference shift. But that also means when you take a 10 a.m. reference shift, you might be answering questions from people from other libraries. So that can be interesting and challenging. And then, of course, I hope you've heard of LibGuides, and if not, I think you probably need to take 210 or some class where you build one, because if you're going to be a subject specialist librarian, for sure, you're going to be making these, or maybe using WordPress or another um, tool to make something similar. So I find that I consider this to be kind of reference because it's point of need information for students, so I spend a lot of time on mine and I make them kind of colorful. And then, this is another software called LibAnswers that we use that make FAQs. So again, that kind of point of need natural question response um, that we can put online for our, our patrons. So there's kind of like this trifecta of academic librarianship, and the first thing is reference, and the second thing is information literacy instruction. This is kind of an ideally typical um, instruction room in a library. We all wish that we had this many screens, maybe, and these nice tables for students. But usually in many libraries, there's a classroom or two where you can do info lit instruction for like beginning writing classes or upper division research classes, at least at the, um, the Cal State, that's what it's like. And this is a real instruction session that uh, goes on at SJSU. This isn't me, this is Tina, a great librarian that retired recently. But you do get to like do hands-on work with the students, um, helping them find resources and write their papers. That's usually called the one-shot. The one-shot is when you have like one session during one class time over the um, like term, uh, and then they probably email you later to get more information. Sometimes the one shot is called course integrated, which is um, a little bit nicer term for it. And some people teach for credit information literacy courses. Both Elizabeth and Jeffra do this, so they can speak more to that. And then there's embedded librarianship, which is becoming a lot more common, and I do um, a lot of that. And so some things we do for that are make online modules for the learning management system. Uh, we actually make some assessments that go in the learning management system and whole suites of tutorials that can be like embedded in online stuff where students can just access on our website, like this is one for topic development. Um, so getting experience with things like learning management systems, which you will have just by, you know, being a SLIS student, but also things like web, uh, what is it called, screencasting software like Jing or Captivate or Camtasia, those things can be really useful to get you started um, with infolit tutorials and instruction. And then collection management is like that third part of the trifecta, right? And a lot of people think of collections like these stacks at King, you know, lots of books, lots of bookshelves. That's changing, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But what we do mostly with our collections are select new things, you know, so you want to make sure you know the trends and your subject areas so you can select the right stuff. Weeding, so what don't you need anymore? And statistical analysis, because what you need to do is figure out who uses what, when, and will use it, and how and why. And um, sometimes you get more statistics than others, depending on the product or your kind of institution's ability to collect electronic data. Uh, so systems librarians can help with that too. But more than print collections now, we're really looking at digital and electronic collections, so electronic databases online journals, ebooks, and even like this iPad itself is part of collection management, I think, because like at San Jose State, we check out laptops and iPads and MacBook Pros, and so who needs, like how many of those we need and how long we should check them out for and who uses what is, is actually still part of that collection management, you know, a kind of collection of things even. 
And if you are on the tenure track, like me, research and publication is like one of maybe the fourth part of the trifecta. I'm not sure what four uh, sections are called. But if you really like to research and write, you might consider the tenure track. If you want to see your name splashed, you know, along with in a scholarly journal, you might want to consider, you know, doing publications on the tenure track. And if you like to present best practices and research, that's another thing that might clue you that that's a good fit for you. Uh, for presentations, I usually do about two a year at least. Um, I've presented at ACRL and next week I'll be at the Distance Library Services Conference in Denver. If you're wondering if that's the way to go for you, you might want to go to a conference and see how, you know, people are there and what the presentations are like, or try to do a poster session on something you're working on in a class and see if, if you enjoy that. Um, you could also work with faculty to do some publications to see if that's for you. I think it's important to decide if you want to do that tenure track or not. And this uh, watch here is not accidental, that stop that stopwatch because it's an added pressure and you need to do it in a certain amount of time. So like I have six years to achieve tenure, so I have to publish a certain amount of things and, you know, present a certain number of times and, and Jeffrey can talk a little bit about this too. So that's something you want to balance for sure. And you're going to do that along with a bunch of other things, right? So I really like digital initiatives and online learning, so I tend to gravitate towards those. But these are all things that you could potentially do as an academic librarian. And I think the great thing is the flexibility to choose which of these you're interested in and focus on them because you have some academic freedom, you have some freedom in your own career planning. If you love to plan events, then by all means have guest speakers and, you know, plan exhibits and find a career or find a position in an academic library that um, allows that and encourages that, that values that type of interest um, because there is a lot of flexibility there. And now it's off to Elizabeth. Okay, hi everyone. Um, before I get started, I wanted to see, make sure that um, everybody can hear me okay. So go ahead and click that applause button for me if you can hear me just fine. Okay, great. Maybe I just wanted to see people applauding. Um, give me a round of applause. Uh, before I get started, make me feel better. So um, my name again is Elizabeth Thomas. Um, I again work with Christine at San Jose State University and for most days that's where I work, um, but on Thursdays I go to Ohlone Community College. So I am a librarian that um, work at two different locations. Splitting your time at two or more locations is common for librarians, especially when you are uh, first starting out. So at SJSU, I am the Community Outreach Librarian. This position is an adjunct position. It, uh, adjunct librarians can also be called a part-time librarian, a seasonal employee, or a temporary position. It is a uh, faculty. We do have faculty status. Um, and I think the preferred name is adjunct librarian, though, because personally, I have been here for over five years, so it doesn't feel so temporary for me. Um, I do get a yearly contract. This position is equivalent to a lecturer at, uh, at a campus who teaches one or two classes, but it's not a full-time professor. Um, cur so currently um, at San Jose State University Library, there are 12 adjuncts that work in the, um, in the library. Our hours range from as low as four hours a week to up to 36 hours a week. Um, my hours cur uh, currently are 28 hours but, uh, a week, but it has fluctuated through years from uh, 20 hours to uh, 36 hours. Every spring semester, I receive a new contract um, that I have to sign, which can be scary when it gets close, um, but it always seems to come, come and, um, and everything does work out. The contract does start in July and then it goes through the um, academic year until June, and it only lasts one year. Job tasks really vary between the 12 of us. Some adjunct librarians' um, main responsibility is, a staff, is to staff reference hours. 
um, a few of us are subject liaison librarians. Like Christina mentioned, being a subject librarian um, is actually more typical for a tenure track librarian, but sometimes um, things happen, for example, maternity leave, uh, retirement, or just the workload gets too high, so um, adjuncts librarians step up and um, fill in the position for maybe a semester or two or maybe more permanently. The rest of the adjunct work on projects that support an area in the library. One um, librarian, um, for example, maintains our institutional repository. Another one works a lot with the web development team and then does um, work on the library website. So, um, but all of us, we do um, have to do reference hours, and then um, quite a few of us, but not all of us, do teach those one-shot classes Christina mentioned. Um, so we have a variety of jobs. So my um, job is I do the community outreach. Um, and so in addition to working at the reference desk and teaching some of those one-shot classes, um, I get the library involved in campus-wide events like freshman orientation and transfer day. These events typically include tours, resource fairs, orientations, or even sometimes games. These events are always year-round, um, so into the summer and right after Christmas break. Um, I also do a couple um, special resource fairs and tours for different events in the community. Um, this photo is actually us at um, Dia de Portugal in San Jose um, during the summertime, and we're, we're doing a resource fair there. Um, I also collaborate with the provost office on campus and with the bookstore on events in the library. Um, one of them is called the University Scholar Series, which happens six times a year. And another event I do is called the Annual Authors Awards. These events showcase uh, SJSU book authors and other extensive research faculty do on campus. Um, so there's a lot of event planning that I, I work on. Um, I also create materials and publicize events and services. This includes two newsletters um, that I do every semester and also advertisement in the campus newspaper. Um, one of the newsletters that I do goes out um, by email to the entire campus and the other is printed and mailed to community members um, that are interested in the university library. And this is a picture of the, the advertisement, one of the advertisements I do um, in the, the newspaper on campus. So um, if not everybody knows this, we, the King Library, where Christina and I work, is also a joint library between the um, uh, San Jose Public Library. It's the main, uh, main library to the city. And um, I work a lot with the San Jose Public Library on large events for the library. We just celebrated last fall the King um, Library's 10th anniversary, and I was on the committee to put together an awareness campaign. We did events and games. This is a, a photo of um, our a cappella uh, group that we have on campus called Pitch Please, and they sang on the first floor to everybody who was walking by, and it, it, uh, the sounds reached up a couple of floors, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm also the liaison librarian for the Friends of the King Library Bookstore, which is a nonprofit bookstore that we have um, in the building. Um, and I am also a liaison to the King Library's docent program, who gives tours in the library about its history and, and artwork. So I have many projects that I, I work on. Um, so my job frequently changes from day to day, which I really appreciate. I'm not just sitting in front of the computer. I'm out doing many different things. So, so in general, um, I wanted to mention about adjunct librarians is that hours vary in numbers each semester. It's a great way to gain experience because things change so often. Um, and you can see all the adjunct librarians were, are doing different things. It gives you the flexibility to work in multiple environments and on multiple projects. Uh, you have to have the flexibility to try new projects, though, and seize the opportunities because um, when it gets closer to the end of the contract, they might ask you to do other diff different projects or other things. So you have to really seize the opportunity and try something new that you might not have thought of doing and just give it a try. And you don't, um, you don't know, though, what 
your hours will be like in the future. So mine's fluctuated from always as low as 20, but it's gone up to 36 many times too. So most days I am at um, San Jose State, but then on Thursdays I focus my attention to Ohlone Community College as a reference librarian from 2 to 8 p.m. Um, and then in addition to that, on the side, I teach a six-week class for Ohlone. It is an online class and it teaches undergraduates basic research strategies and it's a one-unit class. Um, while I work at the reference desk, it is an hourly job. I do sometimes teach in person if a one-shot class falls on my time, but for the most part, I am at the reference desk the entire time, um, which is also the circulation desk. And this is a picture of my student assistant and, and where her and I sit, and it's both the reference desk and the circulation desk. It's pretty small. Ohlone Community, Ohlone Community College has two campuses. I work at the smaller of the two campuses, which focuses in on health science and technology, and the entire campus consists of one building. The library is one large room with a corner dedicated to the bookshelves. Most of the books are at the Fremont campus that can be, and that's the main campus, that can be shipped over, but for the most part, we show students ebooks and library databases. So this is an image of made probably 95% of the books that we have in the room, um, and that's, that's all we, we use. So it's pretty easy to shelve and help them find books at that um, location. Um, we also share this room with the Writing Center, who's across the room. You can kind of see them. There's a couple books in the back and a couple shelvings. They have desks back there. Um, so if you work at a smaller college or community college, or if you just work at a second campus, it might look like this, where you share a room with another department. Main campuses of community colleges have a whole room or a whole floor or two, but not typically the whole building. You're usually in the um, uh, in a building with other departments. Community colleges are smaller than CSUs, which I think allow you to get to know the students better because you see each other more frequently. Um, I do help them with similar things as I do at SJSU, but the research assignments and topics are typically lower division college assignments. Uh, for the two libraries Ohlone has, in total there are three full-time li um, full librarians. Only one of them, though, is at the campus I am at. These positions are tenure-track positions, um, and in addition there are about six part-time librarians to fill in, the F at the fill in for reference hours. There are two staff members who remain at the main campus. We have student assistants working the circulation part of the Newark campus library, um, which you know doesn't have a lot of uh, a lot of books. They usually check out laptops, reserve desktop. Uh, uh, sorry, reserve text. Um, they do the reserve textbooks or the books uh, textbooks from um, different classes. They do media, and then some books get checked out. Course reserves. Thank you, Christina. Um, she mentioned to me the, the correct term for it is course reserves. In addition to reference help I provide, I'm in charge of managing all of the statistics we do uh, for workload and also the signage that we have in the room. Other uh, reference librarians do cataloging and then some of them do maintenance of periodicals. So, and then we all do troubleshooting of computers, the printer, and the um, scanner. Full-time librarians do not work summers or in between the fall and spring semester. Um, so part-timers usually fill in at the reference um, hours for the summer. Um, but for the last four or last two years, there has only been about 10 reference hours allotted per week, so it's not a lot of hours that you get during the summertime. Uh, many community colleges, let me scroll on. Uh, many community colleges offer an online library course. At Ohlone, it's, it is not mandatory. Um, there are two classes that are offered per semester. It is a six-week class, one-unit um, class that ho can hold about 50 students in each class. 
right now only part-time librarians are teaching it um, because the full-time librarians are um, doing a massive project. They're going through a massive reading project that they're working on and also they're going through WASP right now, um, which is the accreditation. So they're, they've been taking other places. So they've, um, the adjuncts have really had an opportunity to jump in and, and try new things. So in general, I wanted to say for the for community colleges, they are smaller communities and you frequently work with the same students. Um, your reference questions will be in a variety of subjects for lower division college assignments. Um, you must have knowledge in all the library databases. There are like less databases than um, CSUs or UCs um, because it's not a research library. You will be working on a lot of projects to maintain services because you won't have a huge um, staff support. You can see at the reference desk that I had, I only had the student assistant with me. You will be doing a lot more hours at the reference desk than a larger library. You might not have the staff, so, and yeah, you might not have the staff members with you next to it. Sometimes I'm, I'm there by myself without even a student assistant. Um, there are, though, opportunities to have summers off, so if that's something you're interested in, um, you might want to look to community colleges. And it's a great, great opportunity to pop up um, being an adjunct because I get to do so many variety of things and have the opportunity to be at multiple locations. And that's the end of my presentation, so I'm going to give it off to Jeffra. Okay, hello. Um, so I am just going to be doing um, a comparison of my experiences of working at um, UC Irvine, which is a research one institution, and my current experience at um, CSU East Bay, a traditionally considered a teaching institution. So I've kind of done a little bit of charts to sort of um, and I, I, I left all the pictures to uh, Christine and Elizabeth, so there are, no, are not any lovely photos in mine, but um, I just wanted to share and kind of do a contrast, compare and contrast of the two different locations. Um, and, you know, it's just, I think these things, as they've already mentioned, are important uh, for you to think about um, as you're deciding where do you want to go. Um, sometimes it sort of can be anything, and then other times you might want to be a little bit more selective. Um, so first of all, just to kind of create a little bit of context, just thinking about the organi organizational structure of the library. Um, at UC Irvine, it was um, fairly vertical with a very strong supervisor-employee uh, relationship. So I met like monthly with my supervisor. We talked about what I was working on, what I needed to do. Um, and they would very much outline what I should be working on. Do this, don't do that. Um, but it was also, it was very clear what the expectations were and the reporting lines of how everything worked. Um, at East Bay, it's much flatter. Um, technically, the, I guess, the university librarian or the dean is, would be sort of considered my supervisor, um, but workload is discussed and jointly agreed upon. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of flexibility. There's, we call it kind of academic freedom in what you do. Um, I can kind of sort of direct myself on the research that I'm interested in and um, the projects that I want to do. And, uh, but kind of on the sort of counterpart of that is that communication and expectations can be kind of vague. So um, not always sure what maybe people are expecting you to be doing because there isn't necessarily a lot. So you've really got to be very self-directed. You know what you want and you go and you pursue it rather than having someone else tell you. Um, and so that can take a little bit to adjust to sometimes. Um, the librarian status, uh, both um, Christina and Elizabeth have already kind of alluded to this. Um, at UC Irvine, there's not a tenure process, you do not have faculty status, but we have something else there called academic, um, well, we were called academic staff, so in, as opposed to staff and faculty, that we were labeled as academic staff, which was sort of an in-between. Um, we, um, we had to achieve career status, so instead of tenure, they called it career status uh, in six years' time, just kind of like the tenure, um, but instead of having a, a dossier, um, which is possibly as much as three three-inch binders of materials. So it's kind of like your e-portfolio um, that you have to do in some ways. Um, but for the career status, it was just really one manila folder. 
<laughs> of like your evidence, which is so much smaller. Um, and then every two years, you're kind of, your, your progress is reviewed um, towards that career status. And you can actually go up for it earlier than the six years uh, if you want to. And that seems to just kind of vary from one UC to another. Um, and the review process stays internal to the library. So it just, it just kind of goes through your supervisors. There is, a, we did actually have a committee, and I think other UCs do, a library, librarian review committee that reviews your um, file and provides a recommendation to the library director. Um, but other than that, it never leaves the library. At Cal State East Bay, we do have a faculty status. We're on tenure track, um, unless they already have tenure. Uh, there, it takes, you have six years to complete your, your dossier. And um, you could go early, and that just varies. Like, East Bay is particularly resistant to going up early. Um, we did have one person who did that, Diana Wakamoto, and she was able to because she got her PhD very recently from the Swiss program. So that kind of gave her sort of an exception. But typically, it's not the norm at all. Um, and the process, so it's internal for the first part of it where, um, and it's like, it's at our, at East Bay, it's, we turned it in in November and then again in November and then it was a year and a half in January, then a year, a year later in January and then the final one is due in October. So there's different deadlines um, that kind of shift and you just have to kind of keep track of that. Um, and so in the internal part, it just stays within the library. It goes to the committee and, um, but it doesn't go, and it does go up to the provost, but in a, not in an official review, just kind of saying, looks good, and moves on. Um, when it goes, to, when you actually go for that 10-year review, um, then it does go to the library, but then what happens is it's going to go to the campus faculty um, committee, and uh, they are going to review it. Uh, and then write letters, and it goes on to the provost and the president. So the president doesn't see it in the earlier reviews. Um, and in either case, whether it's career status or tenure, if you don't get it, then you're let go. You're no longer kept on, um, on board as a librarian. So <laughs> some people tend to leave before that happens, usually is kind of their safe um, step. Um, so shared governance, um, I, I put this in because this is important to me. This is something that I really firmly um, believe in. And I was fortunate, actually, at UCI because we did have representatives on most of the academic senate committees, which I actually did a census of all the UCs, and that was not the case with the other UCs. Only um, one person was on the library-related um, academic senate committee. Uh, but we, even though we had this representation, we were non-voting. So we could talk about things, but we couldn't actually vote on any of the decisions. Um, at East Bay and probably at the other CSUs, um, we are um, equal members on shared governance, and so we um, are on various committees, and um, when we can chair in those committees, we might even, there's, I think at, um, which one is it, Maritime, a librarian is going to be chairing the Senate body, actually, next year. So, um, the, I, it's, I, for me personally, that was something really important. I really like being a part of the governance of the campus and part of those decision-making um, bodies, I guess you could say. So that was always very important to me. Um, the students, just to give a little bit of a picture, um, with UCI, as most of the cases with the UCs, is their um, minimum GPA is very high, so you're getting already very high performing students. Um, only one third of the body, this is an approximate number from when I was there, um, is our transfer students. And a majority of the students live on campus. They have extensive on campus housing. And that includes for faculty and staff as well. So it's, it's very much um, kind of in, in a bubble, sort of. Um, there is a significant graduate student population, which includes the PhD students. At East Bay, we accept many students that require um, remedial math and English, so um, that um, can lead. It just it just means that in the classroom you're going to have someone that's very low performing and then someone who's very high performing at the same time, because people who might have been able to go to Berkeley or Stanford for whatever reason, maybe it's um, location or family or whatever they they chose to go to East Bay, but they're up at that top level. They can perform at that high level, um, uh, but they're, you know, they're there with these other students who might be very low performing. So when you teach, you have to be very conscientious about this kind of wider stretch of your, um, of your students. 
two-thirds here are transfer students, so that's a very large population, um, uh, which also makes it a commuter school. Our on-campus housing is pretty small. We have many first-generation college students here um, who really struggle with adapting to college life um, and a very small graduate student population. In, uh, oh, this slide, yeah, so professional achievement, this is kind of going back to us. Um, the, at UCI, um, attending the national conferences and being involved in, you know, committees for these national associations, that's sufficient. That's considered, you know, pretty stellar work. Um, doing presentations and publications are nice, but not necessary. I even had one librarian at UCI tell me that she was told to, she needed to publish less because it was just, just it was too much. It, it drew away from her other primary responsibilities. So when they look at your career status or they look at what you've been doing, they want to make sure what you've been doing, what you've been working on, where you've been spending your time is on the primary duties um, and not so much on your own research. It's not really supported. Um, and then as far as like the monetary support to go to conferences, that it was evenly divided amongst all the librarians. Every, it was just divided up amongst everybody. Um, whereas at East Bay, um, and when you have this faculty status, the presentations and publications, uh, particularly peer-reviewed journal articles, are absolutely necessary. You've got to be, and, and how much you do, or that kind of varies from one CSU to another here at East Bay. It's pretty, um, it's pretty high expectations. Um, and then attending conferences is useful. It's not something that's required. Um, they do like it when you do these presentations, but you don't have to do necessarily national stuff. Um, and it's useful also to be building relationships so that you have some future research possibilities. And then our, how our funds get divided up is on a, based on a point system. Like if you're speaking, you get, you know, a point. If you're untenured, you get another point. Um, and so a lot of times library faculty who are already tenured don't actually get much support at all to go. Um, so it's just something else to kind of think about. So getting into some of the duties um, and the functional aspect of being a librarian with collections um, at UC Irvine, and it's the case with many research institutions, it's going to be very subject intense, very collections oriented work. Um, <laughs> this surprised me when I started working there and they were calling it they're calling themselves bibliographers, and I was like, what? People still use this? You know, and then every once in a while you hear somebody say BI, which is bibliographic instruction, and, um, but they're still kind of in that, that place. Um, and then the collections are primarily focused on faculty research. We had, we were going to cancel something, and one single faculty member said, no, you can't, and so we immediately put it back on the list. Um, if they want something, you get it, you know. Um, what their voice is like is like gold. If they say something, we do it their way. Um, because we don't have any faculty status and we're just a service for the campus um, rather than an actual academic unit. Um, the budget, though, for the collections is very, very large. You can get a lot of really great resources. So as a librarian, that can be kind of fun to be able to play in those and to teach about them and um, work with them at the reference desk. Um, it's really, that can be really exciting. Um, here at East Bay, it's really, we do have subject specialty here. Um, but it's not as extensive as it was at UCI. Um, and so it's kind of more generalized. Um, we have a lot of discussions um, holistically about our collections. Um, and then the, when, when I came here, I also kind of made a blunder. I was like, well, what are the faculty doing? How do I know what to collect based on the faculty research? And they, they all shook their heads to me and said, no, we want to focus on what the students' information needs are. What are, what are we gonna, how are we going to help them um, have, be successful academically? And, you know, pursue their scholarly um, endeavors. So it kind of focuses more on the students. And then the budget is, um, is much lower. So, and it, this again will vary across the CSUs, but my understanding is like their book budgets are much less. Like my, I'll just say that my book budget at UCI was um, in like the 14,000 zone. And then here it's like single thousand zone, <laughs> much lower single thousand zone. Um, so it, it just, you know, that's something to, it, I think you, uh, when you have that lower budget, you have to be really careful and very specific about what you're going to buy. And you really want to make sure it's going to be something that's going to be used. Um, 
and then with instruction. So at UCI, it was integrated in all in all the freshman English writing courses. So we had a couple of different kinds. Um, all of them were required to have a first session in the library classroom, and that focused very specifically on the research tools that that would help them with their argumentative writing paper. Um, and then there was an optional second class or session where we would go into their actual classroom. And some some of the instructors took advantage of that, and some some didn't. And then the subject librarians also did course integrated instruction or one shots. Um, and some of them were, I think some were more embedded, um, but most just kind of went in and out. And I was a science librarian, so uh, I didn't have quite as much of that. <laughs> it took me having to like really punt people down if I wanted to go into one of their classes. Um, the teaching uh, here at East Bay, we we have a two-unit information literacy course that all the freshmen are required to take. And again, remember that only one-third of our students come in as freshmen, two-thirds come in as transfers. So we're still missing a chunk of our students, but we are also getting a good chunk in. But um, the class itself is very different from the one-shot because it's focusing on all the components of information literacy, and it's not so much focused on research. These students, um, many of them are still in the remedial areas of English math, and um, they can't necessarily even write very well, and their vocabulary might even be sort of small. So we have to kind of reach these different ends of the spectrum on what they can do. And really, I just focus more on how do you deal with information today? You know, how do you use it? How do you evaluate it? And, um, they come into the class going, I don't know why I'm here. What, I already know how to like open a book, you know, <laughs> and the class is really much more than that. Um, we have, speaking of adjunct faculty, we, that's where a majority of our adjunct faculty work is with teaching this course. Oh, and I'm running out of time, so I better swiftly go through it. I think that's what that means from Christina. Um, I got a little ping. Um, so anyways, I'm going to zip through here. We do also do course related here. and. For reference, it's very similar between the two, except that because of the more um, vertical structure at UCI, we had to report regularly with our head of reference. We had monthly training sessions. Um, I had to set specific goals to work on to improve my reference skills. And we had a really cool um, appointment service called Research Consultation Service. At East Bay, it's, there was not really any training, and all of our public services and our committee actually decides and determines the policies and procedures. Um, the salary, that's, that's my last slide, hurrah, um, that, which is probably what you're all waiting for, um, is uh, that you see, the UCs start at a lower base, but you do get a steady increase every two to three years, um, and the, the amount is um, set at each rank, so all the UCs at that rank, all, C, U, all UC librarians will receive that amount at that rank. Um, you can sort of skip, I think, a rank, they can kind of do that, but that takes some negotiating. Um, at East Bay, there, it's a, the base is a little bit higher, um, but you don't get any, you might get some like general salary increases, but there's no other official increase until you get tenure six years later. Um, and then as far as like the range, there's a range for um, that level and what you come in at will vary from one CSU to another. And you can go to that website if you want to see what CSU librarians are actually making. Um, so that's kind of fun because it's paid for by the state, so they have to make it publicly available. So um, that is all I have to say. So I will pass it to somebody else. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you. You have so much great information. Um, Jeff, what I found is that even at the R1, the, the, the research universities, it was possible if it was a state university like a UC to delve deeply into the Internet and sometimes find the pay scale as well. So I'm going to let Christina finish up her slides and then we'll open it to questions. Go for it, Christina. Oh, I think I'm just going to throw this up, but um, definitely I want people to ask questions now. Or we would all love you guys to ask questions. Um, but I just actually want to talk to say this last one, internships, do them everywhere you can, meet people and try different things. I did internships that taught me I didn't want to be an archivist. <laughs> I wanted to be an academic librarian, so try it out definitely before you commit. And um, the one thing I want to do before we get into specific questions is I'd be really interested if 
participants could write on the chat window what was new information for you in these presentations. I don't know how many school students hear about the tenure versus non-tenure track, you know, possibilities and this sort of thing. So I'd be interested in knowing what was new for you. In any case, let's open for questions. Um, put your hand up if you want to take the mic or just type questions into the chat. Thank you. Evan, take the mic if you can get it and ask your question. Okay, I, I was actually um, curious about the uh, the tenure and uh, research responsibilities. I was surprised to hear that uh, UC was no tenure, uh, UC Irvine was no tenure, and uh, East Bay was. I was, I mean, since it's uh, uh, since UC is a research institution, I thought it would have been the other way around, if anything. Um, is this typical for UCs? Or are, um, I was just somewhat surprised by that. Yeah, um, it is. So uh, it's the same across all the UCs and and the same in the CSUs. And I think, you know, I the historic people can, and actually even Jane might even know this, but um, I believe in the CSUs, some, and it varies across the country, okay, because there are some research um, institutions that do have the tenure status, so the University of Colorado is one of them, Purdue University, um, so so that does, that does happen, um, but it seems to be more common among the teaching, um, the teaching institutions, maybe those faculty member were more willing to accept librarians as peer than at high level research institutions where they might, might say, you're never going to be producing the research level that I am. And so maybe that was why it was a little bit harder, but, and I'm, I'm sure this is historically written down somewhere, but I haven't um, pursued it yet, so I have only hypotheses in my head. Um, but there, there are definitely positives and negatives to both, and you really have to just kind of fit, figure out which one you feel most comfortable doing. Well, yeah, and I'll speak up because I was a continuing education specialist in extension at UC Berkeley for a long time and worked with a lot of the librarians. And even as continuing education specialists, we were in the same classification as librarians. We were called non-teaching academic staff, and we did have promotion requirements that were different, but we were not on the tenure track. Um, again, I'll say if it's important to you, to be a faculty and be involved at that level, if you like the research and the pressure to produce peer-reviewed papers and journals and stuff, go for it. If you prefer not to have to ever write another paper again once you graduate with your master's degree, then think about that. So as long as you're aware when you're looking at positions which one this particular one is, that would help. Um, I'm going to run through some more questions in the chat. Um, it looks like uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Jenny wanted to know if adjunct librarians work during the summer and did you get benefits? Because I think benefits is very important. So um, Elizabeth, can you speak to that, please? I wrote it also in the um, chat, but um, yeah, so uh, benefits, you, there are benefit opportunities at some. You do want to, um, when you're looking at the opening position, to see if there is opportunities for that. Um, so I do have benefits through San Jose State. You have to work 20 hours or more to receive that, um, but there aren't opportunities like that at um, Ohlone College, so it is something that you have to take a, a, into consideration when um, working uh, adjunct position. There are some adjuncts that have to pay for their own benefits, but they work a couple different libraries. Um, so yeah, it is something, uh, it is a factor. For, you, for those of you who are teaching, if you were teaching a three credit info lit class, how many hours a week would you be actually teaching? And I'd like to throw in how many hours do you prepare for that teaching and then do you do grading? I can speak for the one at Cal State East Bay. So ours is actually two, um, two units and it is two hours a week in class time, um, in theory. Um, and um, preparing, I, you know, I think there's some CSU like, 
wide calculation for what it's supposed to be per unit, and I, I feel like it's something like 2.5 or something per unit, so in theory I should be spending like five hours outside of class preparing for it, and I can tell you I probably spend like 20 hours on it. I mean, because I want to, I want to do it well, and so I'm always, I'm putting so much time into thinking about what am I going to do in the classroom, how am I going to, you know, what assignments am I going to give them, how's the final, how's this all going to be working towards their final project? Um, I have office hours that I have to do with them, you know, I've got emails and, um, and so I put a lot of time into what's just a two-unit course. Um, it's really a challenge, and yes, I do grade, and that is quite terrifying because students are very crazy about their grades. Um, and I, I definitely had a very, very difficult student one quarter who came into my office and basically yelled at me for 20 minutes. And it was just, and I have over 100 emails between the student. It was just the craziest thing. So um, when you're doing grades, it's a whole other, like, playing field. Whew. I uh, definitely agree with Jeffra. Um, I find that I spent more time before the class starts. My class is a six-week class, so I spent a lot of time preparing, setting everything up, um, and then into the shell. So I could, I would, I think about 20 hours I probably spent beforehand getting it all prepped the first time. This is my second semester working on the same class, um, so it was a lot less. Um, so and then maintaining it was, it's just a couple hours per week, and then I do grade some of the tests and then I have other um, tests self-grade, and then I have a final project uh, annotated bibliography that I have to grade that could take just as long to get through. Um, we have also in our class, it could be up to 50 students. There's um, some dropouts, so I've got about 40 students right now in my class, so that's 40 annotated bibliographies that I have to grade um, at next week when they're due. Um, but during the week, it's just really maintenance, discussion boards, answering questions, and then some grading in between. I'm going to um, say that we'll all stay a little bit after to keep answering questions. So don't, if you have to leave at 6.30, feel free to leave, but I think all the rest of us can stick around a little bit. Um, Deborah had a really good question about saying she has an interview soon to be an adjunct, but it's part of a pool. Have any of you experienced being in a pool? Did you have set hours? What was the advantage? I'll say too, doing any kind of interview is good for you. It's interview experience, but I don't know what happens if you get hired as part of a pool. Being in the pool is a pretty typical way that librarians start. So um, you'll interview and then you'll go into a pool of kind of accepted adjuncts. But some of the, like, we have a, an adjunct librarian that's actually a subject liaison for math and computer science and, and they kind of pull sometimes um, adjuncts out of the pool because of special skills. So we needed a STEM person, we didn't have a full-time person and, and they took from the pool because someone had those skills and um, that could be really useful and it kind of uh, puts your name out there and then the hours are going to depend on the contract and Elizabeth could probably talk about that more but um, I know a lot of librarians who kind of move from the pool to the adjunct to the full time. Anybody else want to raise a hand and ask a question? Go for it. I was trying to think of something to add on to Christina's conversation about the pool, um, she pretty much summed it up though. Um, we have a pool here and um, so a couple people have been pulled out because of their specialization or availability and then um, also, yeah, contracts, it's just um, what they kind of contract out in the beginning, you'll, you'll know how many hours you're going to work per, per week. Um, just how they have it set up. So you kind of, after you interview and you get pulled and in, put into the pool, they'll um, ask you if you're available to do something and it's, they'll give, tell you how many hours and what the position is and then you can accept or, or not. Um, I wanted to actually respond to June about the tenure track and the research and writing. At the community college, um, you can be on tenure track and and simply get it from, not to say simply, but get it from service and, you know, that reference and the instruction and the collection development and service to the university. You don't need to do those publications and those presentations. That is more of like a 
a kind of four-year teaching college thing. Is my understanding that many people get tenure at community college without um, public without publications. Um, and then for the second languages, I'm not sure uh, what you mean. And then I guess, Jenny, the, your question about the job outlook. So, I mean, I think like two or three years before I graduated, it was pretty tough. I heard it was very, very tough. And even now, there will be a large number of applicants for each job, but I hear a lot of people are, are getting jobs, like, because the budget has opened up, especially in California, but also nationally, I think, um, more positions are being opened. Uh, so that's always a great thing. And then getting into the pool to start is a good idea. Claire, go for it. I just had a question about, um, I guess, programming and digitization skills. Are you guys finding that those kinds of skills are more in demand now? Um, so I'll say that at San Jose State, um, Digit, we digitized quite a bit of our special collections and we're always working on that. Programming skills are huge um, and that's very useful once you kind of get hired and get into the job. Um, but we are actually not hiring anyone with those skills particularly, but that doesn't mean that other places aren't. I don't know, Jeffra, what would you say? Um. Yeah, um, <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, they did do the web services kind of thing here. Uh, what's been happening here at East Bay is that we have been feeling like we need to tack something onto the subject. So we did STEM slash web services. They did like um, we did right now. We have social sciences and assessment, and then we put another one in for health and nursing and scholarly communication. So there's been this kind of like trying to add these sort of dual responsibilities to make it more like a powerful um, sort of uh, faculty request, faculty position request, because it, it has to get approved by the, the provost. When you're using these kind of hot terms, you know, then, then it's kind of more likely to be sort of accepted. Um, but, but not, I haven't seen anything really um, uh, so aggressive on technology per se. At UC Irvine, they did create a, an emerging technologies librarian, and that was hired around the same time I was in 2009, um, early 2009, um, but nothing so much since that time. Yeah, I think I see the digital initiatives librarians come up. Like I've seen a couple of those recently from Baynet, which is another thing I want to share that if you all are in the Bay Area at all, Baynet is a great place. They post jobs all the time. But um, uh, they have digital initiatives librarians, but oftentimes they have a subject area tacked onto that. So you're going to be a subject specialist and do digital initiatives in, in the kind of as part of your job, like Jeff was talking about. And I think that that gives you a lot of area to apply those cool skills like digitization and programming. And so if you have those, those are the kind of jobs you probably want to be looking for. Um, I also want to answer June's question about is tenure track just a status um, thing or does it offer more benefits? What exactly does it mean? Um, it's, I, I definitely, I think it's, it's, it is a status thing, it is it's definitely a status thing, but I think it's, it's much more than that. Um, we have, with the tenure, they can't just toss you out. Um, it, it, it very much secures your position. It also um, secures you to have a good amount of academic freedom. So they can say do this and you can say no, you know. Um, and I'm saying this in really informal ways and someone else can probably put this a lot more eloquently. Um, we follow an RTP document. And, um, and that outlines, you know, our, our responsibilities. Um, but we can't, the uh, administration can't force us to do anything outside of our RTP documents. Um, I wanted to say that we've just 
published on Swiss Web in the Career Development, Career Direction section, a couple of pages on working in academic libraries. It does go into more detail on this. And then you can always contact the speakers um, offline and ask them, or you can talk to me. Um, I think we need to wrap it up. So here's your slide on how to get to everybody else. And I'm on Swiss Web under faculty, Jane Fisher. So then I will say good night to everybody, and thanks so much to all the speakers. And uh, people graduate from our school and get really good jobs and then come back and give us great talks. So thank you all, and eventually.